Well, we'll chase a few people in from the, uh, from the lobby, and if I can find my little note card and my cheat sheet. If you see somebody running around here that looks a lot like Bo, looks a lot like Bo, it probably is Bo, but he's gotten so big now, uh, he may want to read his New Testament in Greek to you. That's how, that's how big he has, he has gotten. Welcome back, Bo. It's always great to see you. Thanks for staying for, for... He stayed in town and didn't go home just to come to church. And there's other people sitting at home right now who didn't come to church, and they don't have a reason for not being here. So thank you, Bo, for, for being here. Um, we'll let the kids go uh, just before we begin our, our worship and song and music, but they'll stay through the lighting of the Advent candle in just a moment. After the worship... Uh, Ernie has some books. There's about five or six. They're all focused on the Advent. Uh, if you want to pick one of them up, they'll be out on the desk at the uh, Welcome Center. And so there's no fee or no donation for that. And they're really well done. David Jeremiah, Billy Graham, uh, John Piper. There's Bob Lapine, uh, who is the announcer for Focus on the Family and some others. So those will be out there and you can pick one of those up. Uh, hopefully to use with your mate or with your family. Remember Bruce? He usually sits right here uh, with the white hair and the beard, and he is in Kenya. So if you would make a note to, to pray for Bruce uh, as he is in Kenya, and he'll be there for an another couple of weeks uh, for his ministry there um, in Malindi, or I think it's in Malindi, Kenya. Be in prayer on the back of your, and everybody pick one up. There's, there's several, there's eight different verses here. Pick up, and, and if you haven't gotten one, just feel free to pick up one that's in a, an empty chair this morning and take those home with you. On the back, there's some things to pray for. In gratitude, please pray for, and one of those is hospitality. How we will, and if we will, open up our home during this holiday season um, to share hospitality with neighbors, uh, with family certainly, or with someone that you are working to toward sharing the gospel with, or even reading through portions of the, the New Testament. At Advent, it's a great time to go to Luke 2 and read through it and, and, and ask questions and work through that. So uh, hospitality and remembering those who are in humble circumstances that are, uh, are all around us in our community. So you can pick up some of those various scriptures that are in the, uh, in the seats. Be prayerful about our benevolence. We've got the giving tree. For those of you who are unaware, uh, during Christmas, um, in, over and above what we would normally give to support the church through our tithes and our offerings, we give to the giving tree, and it goes into our benevolence, and we use that throughout the year to meet needs in our community. So be mindful of the needs that we will meet, and the need uh, for the revenue, the dollars, to go towards that. And so ask God what part you would play in our benevolence and our outreach. There will be a, a business meeting tonight at 6 o'clock, and we will have our small group at 5 o'clock. We'll spend most of our time praying, and then we'll come in when it's time. Bad news, there won't be any food tonight, okay, because we got to go straight from small group to business meeting. Um, we won't be having any, any food tonight for our fellowship time with our small group. This morning, we begin the, uh, the Advent season. This is not just a busy activity. And so over the next five weeks, we will have the opportunity to hear from various people who will lead us through more than just the lighting of a candle, uh, but the real meaning of the season which is the, the coming of Christ. Cheryl shared uh, something with me this morning. I want to share this before uh, Roy and Michelle come to, uh, to present the first candle to us. Uh, Bonhoeffer says this, Advent might be compared to a prison cell. I'll make you think early this morning. Advent compared to a prison cell in which one waits and hopes and does various unessential things in a prison cell, but is completely dependent on the fact that the door of freedom has to what? It has to be open from the outside. Advent is expectancy. It's readiness. It's watchfulness. 
its willingness to risk everything for freedom. And then here it is, a new beginning. So Roy and Michelle come and uh, share with us scripture and, and prayer the first Advent candle. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to read I'd like to read from Jeremiah 29:11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Today we light the first candle of the Advent wreath. This is the candle of hope with Christians around the world. We use this light to help us prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we receive God's light as we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thanks be to God. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Psalms 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet has been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up and the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment, judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Once again, I want to share the words from the prophet Isaiah. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Romans 13, 11 through 14. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For, the, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of the darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and directness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. 
but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, as we look to the birth of Jesus, grant that the light of your love for us will help us become lights in the lives of those around us. Prepare our hearts for the joy and gladness of your coming, for Jesus is our hope. Amen. If you will stand to your feet and we'll begin our time of worship through song. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes and be seen. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Here I am to worship. Fount of every blessing, tune my heart. 
If you need to get up and grab some a note sheet, um, feel free to do so. They're in the back and up front. There's some scriptures and pencils there as well if you, uh, if you need those. Heavy heart is not the word, but I, I feel a little, a little unique this morning. Um, for those who have sat through my pre- previous sermons as we've been going verse by verse through the book of James, um, we've, been, we've been talking about trials and we've been talking about difficulties and hardships and vanity. And we've talked about temptation We've talked about sin and, and excess and indulgence that, that, that stems from, from these challenges. They bring discouragement. We've been talking about uh, disbelief, and we've, we've talked about defeat and death. That's what 13 through 15 in James chapter 1 was all about. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own desires. So there's the, there's the problem. There's the, there's the dilemma. And so this morning, we're going to turn from trials and difficulties and temptations to abundance, and to, to blessing. And so uh, we trust that the Lord will add his, his blessing as the Holy Spirit teaches us uh, and reveals to us truth from his word this morning. It's no news to, to anyone here that reads anything or looks at anything really online um, to say that everything changes and everything is changing. What we read yesterday has changed today. Um, it, it just seems like uh, there's, it, it, and we know that, that there's just constant change. But not only is the world changing and things around us, we change. That was my wife, and so, uh, and we changed for the good. Uh huh. Okay, there we go. But we change constantly. What do we change our minds? Well, you said you wanted that for Thanksgiving, and I made it. And look, you're not even eating it. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. We we change we change our likes and our dislikes. We change our attitudes. You know, there's certain football teams that I can't stand unless they play somebody else I can't stand. And then suddenly I change. People say, you don't like them. I do today. I do today. I, I, I pray, bless them today, okay? Our preferences change. Um, and I hope that there are some little little that the Spirit will use this, this opening truth and illustration, and it'll bring a little bit of humor to ourselves when we recognize, you know what? Our life isn't as boring as we really think. We are constantly, we are constantly changing. Not, not only in, in the elements around us, but we change mentally. I can't remember like I used to. I can't do some things mentally I used to be able to do. What little that was. All right, let me put that in contest. Physically. This old body's getting old, and I can't even do some things the grandkids want me to do. And that's humbling, not embarrassing, it's humbling. Emotionally, how I deal with things now has changed. Maybe it's because I have a little more wisdom and knowledge of the Scriptures. Intellectually, what do we study outside of, of, of merely theology or the Scriptures? Are you changing? Are you being challenged in that way? How about this? Financially, we're all who knows what our account is going to be tomorrow? You know what the, what the economy is going to do. And so there's this constant change. As the world and people around us change, we have to change to respond to it. Our, our son and, and, and the grandkids came this week. And so in their coming, we had to respond to that and make some changes that they made. So uh, it was kind of an interesting weekend. Everything pertaining to us and around us changes except one thing and that that one thing is God everything changes and is in constant state of change except God now that's that's like okay that's a big weighty statement but let's let it really sink in this morning Look at, we just, we, I mean, we didn't even blow a, blow a breath at, at, at change in how drastic and extreme it can be, but yet we say, God is unchanging. Let me go on to say, not only is God unchanging, He's unchangeable. 
Make a note of that and come back to it and say, Lord, show me a, 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 not necessarily a deep truth, but just show me the truth about that. Why would it need to be say that he's unchanging the Jaron to being unchangeable? He cannot change. And so this morning we'll see and we'll grow and we'll be encouraged by the one, by the one who is unable to change. Well, I thought there was nothing that God couldn't do. He's unable to change. There's a fancy word for that. You know what it is? It's immutable. His immutability. I've not belabored this this morning. But we see God never changes. He is unchanging and he is unchangeable. And that leads us to James chapter 1. We'll be reading verse 16 through 18 this morning. It'll be on the screen as well. And there's some Bibles in the back or the front if you want to follow along. There is quite a few references that we'll, we'll look at as, this, as well this morning. Beginning in verse 16. Do not be deceived. My beloved brethren, there's a warning, don't be deceived. That doesn't mean tricked. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Many of the references that uh, the Fouts read this morning dealt with God's glorious light. Verse 18. Out of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation, of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord, and, and, and may the Lord bless the reading and the, the study of his word. God is unchangeable. He's perfect he is infinite god is eternal the character the character of god his his attributes we're going to plumb the depths of some of those this morning our encouragement and the blessing this morning grows out of our out of our need and we're all needy people especially those of us who are in the family of god we looked at uh, being tossed by the sea in, in a sea and an ocean of change. Sometimes we feel tossed and we feel battered and we feel defeated. We feel like we're going to go under. We feel like there's no anchor, which, which should cause us to run to Scripture to find our anchors. And we talked about it in one of our previous messages. So let's look in verse 17. Let's look at these gifts of God that can be an anchor to us. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. We'll stop right there. These are, the good and the perfect uh, are two different words. We're not going to do a, re a word study and make it all, but we will delineate why those are, are placed exactly where they are and what they me the good the good every good gift is every act of god is good okay it, it really focuses on god as the actor the perfect here and this is the easiest way you may have to make a note and come back to it we can't spend too much time the perfect aspect of it comes to the result out of God's goodness and his acts, the result is the perfect will of God, the perfect result of God. And this is going to, be, I think for many here, it's going to be a real blessing because they, uh, we, we, we want to too often feel like Eeyore, right? Oh my, not this. Here it comes again. And we go through the mantra, why me, Lord? Why this, Lord? Why now, Lord? Every good and every perfect gift is from above, from the, the Father. Together, they express the nature of what God gives. It's not one and the other, but together. God gives what God gives us is beneficial and it's helpful to us. The perfect God gives and makes us complete 
and mature and full in Christ. And everything that he gives us is, is, that's good is working towards that end. It says in, in uh, look at uh, chapter 1, verse 4. But let patience have its what? It's perfect work. See, it's, it's, it's working. It's the, it's the result, having its perfect work, that you, that you may be perfect and complete. And there it was, remember, lacking nothing. Because in Christ we have all that we need. We lack nothing. We lack no good thing. Some of you may recall part of that message. Everything we enjoy comes from God. Sometimes, sometimes in a unique way, in a very direct way, my wife can remind me of that. And it's not a bad thing that everything, everything, everything we enjoy comes from God. Our jobs. Well, I'm not really happy about my job, but it's good and it comes from God. It's not a better perspective, at least yours anyway. Retirement. For those of you that are in retirement, some are th thinking to get into retirement. We've had some discussions. We think retirement, that's, that's, that's good. It's, it, it, it's, it's good from God. Our family, our friends, even our neighbors. You mean the one that, 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 we, that I complain about all the time? Absolutely. There's a goodness in, in, in that. Everything we enjoy, I didn't say like, I said that we enjoy it comes from God. Our talents, our pleasures, our homes, many of our possessions. God is the source, he's the giver of everything we enjoy. How often do we thank him for that? How thankful are we as he gives out of his vast treasure and see, when we take these and view these good things that God gives and we pervert them, that's when we find pain. And that's why we find when we, and how we find destruction. And that's how we find misery. It's, it's, a, it's a good gift of God that's been perverted in some form or fashion. Now, here's where it's going to get a little bit more personal. God's gifts are significant in that there are no degrees, there are no degrees of God's goodness. Now, see, that's really hard for us, and if we don't write something like down and look at it, and then not convince ourselves, but accept that, that truth, there aren't degrees. You say, well, God's got a good, pleasing, and perfect will. Yeah, but that's not degrees. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here. See, when, when we give a gift or we receive a gift, we think, well, that came from the dollar store. It still got the tag on it. That was only a dollar. Well, that came from Walmart, and it's got the five dollars on. Well, this came from Belks. It's got. Look at this. We think of good, and we think of better, and we think of best when we give gifts and when we receive them. And so, when it comes to what God gives, we want to do. Well, is this the best you got, God? Is is this really good, God? Because we have this habit of grading things. There are no degrees of goodness with God. How, how can we put that to rest? God's gifts possess His goodness. And so because of that, they can never be improved upon. We can't ever find ourselves coming to God and saying, I want to upgrade on this. There's no upgrade. There's just not. Picture your last gift, the last good thing you want to say you receive. Can you right now discern God in it? Thanksgiving, the meal. Was it good? Where did you see God? At? Well, we said a prayer before it. When, where did you encounter the, just the goodness, the weightiness of God? And the variety of the food that we had, and God providing such a variety, and there wasn't just one thing and one thing only, and that was sparse. How about the conversation over the table from the kids or the grandkids? How about some good news that came out of that conversation? How about some encouragement that you were able to give? How about some scriptures that might have been read before the meal was, was eaten? The goodness of God. God's not holding out on you or anyone waiting for you to do something to please him or to earn his his goodness or his gift 
if you've received anything from the Lord, you've received the very best that he has to offer. In this season, are we thankful? Would that be a characteristic the community say, you know, I don't know about that bunch down first, but they say sure seem to be thankful. Not just with our words. Not just with our words. Even in hard times. And here's, here's where, uh, you know, I, I prayed and said, said Lord, there's going to be some people here that need to hear this, this truth and receive it. Even in hard and trying times, when we go through testing and temptation, and it's never from God, James is here teaching us that we can be sure that if we will remain faithful, even our testing and our trials will have good in it and can be seen as perfect gifts. Well, we just don't like the sound of that. Because we don't think that way theologically. We don't think that way about God. That, that, that sometimes, even when we're responsible, because those temptations and trials, they come from within. When we yield to that and we do that, there's still the good of God in it. And we don't have to dissect it in order to see it. We just have to understand the character and the nature of God. Those trials and testings can become good and perfect gifts. I can't, I can't count the number of people have, that have just said, what I went through was hell on earth, but good came from it. But good came from it. But good came from it. And it's not God saying, well, I guess I've got to do that, because God doesn't do that, remember? He doesn't cause that. You know, I had a little accident, and, and, I, and I busted up my body, and, and I had 50 stitches, and, and I went through, for me, for me, a pretty rough time, but there was so much good in that. You say, well, how can you have a crash and it be good? You just, you just here's how you know God, and you're open to, to hearing what God has to say and, and to see what God is doing in spite of, in spite of that. Will went on a camping trip, and he, and he sliced his finger off. Has there been good to come out of that? Yeah, there really has. Not just blood and pain and inconvenience. Tommy, Tommy's here. Tommy, Tommy just kissed the bank one night in the pitch dark, running wide open in a boat. And so you think, well, that was all bad. No, there's some good that's come out of that. There really is. Cody was up on a big, huge rock, and he fell, I don't know, 20 or 30 feet up at Devil's Try, uh, up at the devil's waterfall and you think boy that was bad they had to send a rescue team up there but there's good that's come out of that so look at your life say where is god where has god's goodness been around some things that you're still holding a grudge against god over psalm 145 15 and 16 the eyes of all look expectantly to you to who? to god when? During good times and during difficult times. And you give them food in due season. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Matthew 7 as well. What man is there among you if his son asks for bread is going to give him a stone? None. Or if he asks for a fish will give him a serpent? None. Well, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Give good things to those. As I'm going through this, I mean, we need to learn how to, it says if we need wisdom, what? We ask of God, and He gives generously. And He gives generously to all. And He gives generously to all who will ask, and He gives it personally. So we ask God. And even through hard times, and, and that's when we really start, we really cry out to God. When we go through temptations, trials, hardships, disaster, we really cry out to God. Show us the goodness that's tucked inside. So we see this gift of God. I don't want to belabor that. But we also look at God's character and His, His nature. Every good gift, it says in verse 17. Every good gift. Man, that, that word... <laughs> really we need to we need to focus on that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above it comes down it originates with god god is infinitely good james isn't talking about some of our good gifts he's not talking about most of our good where most of our good gifts come from he talks about where every single one of them comes from 
And it's not because we're doing something to please God and to earn that. And here again, we have to say, especially those that come, that originated in trial and hardship. And so how many times have we prayed, Lord, take that away. Lord, take that away. Lord, take that away. I can't endure anymore. But as we do, we find the grace of God tucked inside. Nothing in our life happens by luck. Nothing in our life happens by chance. As I've said many times, nobody even crosses my face just at a whim, right? Crossed in front of me in the parking lot at Walmart or even inside Walmart. Nothing is serendipity. There's, there's, you know, people may say there's karma, but, but there's no karma. Instead of that fortune, if we want to call some of those characteristics that, There is one perfect, there is one holy, there is one unchanging, there is one righteous and all good God. Who out of his perfect love and will, he orchestrates and he he designs all good and every benefit we enjoy. I wonder if we'll all be able to leave here and be able to say with an absolute declaration with God's Spirit being our witness... We are, we are pretty well convinced, because we can't leave here with that absolute, but we're pretty well convinced that every single thing or anything that's good in our life originated with God and came from Him. And not a result of our works, lest no man should boast about it. Because that leads to pride, and we all know pride goes before the fall, haughty spirit before destruction. Psalm 84, 11. The Lord is a sun and a shield. Psalm 84, 11. The Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. All right? Grace. God gives us what we don't deserve. His mercy he doesn't give us what we do deserve. He, he, no good thing with he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing with he withhold. We think we're good parents sometimes with our kids or grandkids. God doesn't withhold. Romans 8, 32. He didn't spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. Not just for a few, for all. How should we not with him also freely give us all things? And that all, it, all things. Sometimes we pigeonhole scriptures for certain occasions or certain sentiments and, and, and we miss a real opportunity to, to receive a blessing from God by, by recognizing it's from him. Every good and every perfect gift, it comes down from the Father of lights all right i'm not going to spend a lot of time on 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 this aspect but in scripture light symbolizes it and reflects god's holiness his purity his beauty because god is the source of all that is beautiful and all that purifies and all that brightens his creation this is not an original thought with me. I can't recall where I, I read this. If something does not reflect the purity, the beauty, and the holiness, and the goodness of God, then it's not from Him. It's from someplace else. If something doesn't reflect the purity, the beauty, the holiness, and the goodness of God, it's not from Him. See, some of these things, we're going to have to just take some notes and come back even on Sunday night as we'll discuss this sermon tonight at six at the small group tonight. As we look at the character and the nature of God and His goodness. Genesis 50, 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But what? But God meant it for good. So here's good coming out of this evil that was meant in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. We can look all through the scriptures and we can see the truth. Romans 8, 29. We all know Romans 8, 28, right? We, we use that. With, we, we just dump that out on people when they go through a hard time. But then verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among the brethren. All things work together for good for those who are called according to God's purpose. God is the only source of good. God is the ultimate source of good. You say, well, how many different ways can we? Well, there's, for some people, you'll, 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 you'll resonate with one, with one aspect of it more so than the other, but they're all true. 
We can't talk about the God, goodness of God too much. We can't talk about the perfections of God too much or His character. There is no variation or shadow of turning with God. None. Because God is unchangeable and He's unchanging. There's not even, you know, it's really there's a beauty there. There's not even a shadow of a chance. There's not a whisper of a, of a chance that God will ever change his character and his goodness and his perfections. So we see, we, we take a glimpse inside the character and the nature of God. We think about, just think about some of the, your favorite characters in the scriptures. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Think of Joseph and Moses and Aaron Think of Job and Isaiah. Think of all those that we would encounter throughout the New Testament if we went through a list in the New Testament. The disciples, the early leaders of the church we read about in Acts. They never experienced a time in their life when God was unable or una uh, unwilling to meet their needs. Never. We go back at scriptures and we say, you know what, that, that bears out, that truth bears up. Why wouldn't and why doesn't that truth humble us and create in us a spirit of constant worship and adoration for the goodness and the perfections of God? We see it in the Scripture when we read these stories. We say, wow, look at God. Go, God. That's incredible. It's not that we wish, we, we wish He was that way for us or for me or He would do those things. Hebrews 13, 8. God's what? He's the same yesterday, today, today forever unchangeable he's unchanging out of this goodness of god he chose to give us life and birth that's where we'll close out this message he chose and that's what the scripture says oh we see as we read these three scriptures they just come right off the page of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth talking about salvation here a kind of first fruits of his creation. God, God demonstrates, he doesn't just talk about it, he demonstrates his abundant saving grace. Abundant saving grace. Well, how so? Well, out of his, out of his own will he brought us forth. And he did so by the word of truth, the scripture tells us. So as an act of, of abundant grace, as an act of of unconditional love and sovereignty, God delivered us. It says He begat us. Some of your translations might say. Or He brought us forth. He gave us spiritual birth. By what? By the word of truth. And Scripture is clear. Though there are some who would say, well, this is, this is a mystery whether, you know, he, he acted first and then He chose and then we chose. You know, there's... Um, some, would, some might have a struggle with that and consider it a mystery, though it's clear. God initiated our salvation by His own will. That's what the Scripture says. That's what the Scripture teaches. He's the initiator. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates His love towards us. And we were still sinners. Christ died for us. In Romans 3, 10. It's written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They, they, they have together become unprofitable. There's none who does good. No, not one. Only God is good. And he's not responsible, recall, in any way, directly or indirectly, for temptation and sin in our life. We have to own up to it. It comes from our own desires. We're enticed and dragged away. God is the giver of life and birth to those who believe in Jesus Christ. Our lust and our sin brings death, as we've already seen in James. But the gift of God is eternal life and new life in Christ. By His grace and His love, he, he, he redeemed us to himself by his choosing. John 1, 12 and 13. But as many as received him, 
to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So for those of you who are here and those who would be watching even on the, the internet, who might be questioning the love of God, the compassion of God, where would any of us be if not for the loving grace of God? Where would any, yeah, I mean, there ought to be like, just answers just ought to be shit coming from all around. We'd be dead in our sins. We'd be condemned. We would be without hope. We'd be awaiting judgment and eternal punishment. That's where we would be. That's the price of sin. Because the wages of sin is death. 1 John 4.10, here in his love. And this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the payment for our, for our sins. Titus 3, 5, be the last scripture. Not by works of righteousness, not by anything that we have done, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. He doesn't give us what we do deserve, eternal separation and death. He saves us, he gives us grace through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. How great is salvation. And, and in this, we're seeing how grace works, how unworthy we are, but, but yet that, that, that goodness and the grace of Almighty God his, his death, His resurrection, His atonement, it should compel us to offer our lives as living sacrifices to Him. To honor Him in all that we do. All that we do. Everything is meant to bring glory and honor to God. To worship Him, and not just on Sunday from 10.30 to 11.30 or 12. And certainly to obey His Word that He's given us. So I wonder if we took just a brief, brief interlude and we looked in and we, and we considered all of the good that God has poured into your life. And, you, and the response is, well, I can't do that. I can't. There's no way. So much I take for granted. So much I just don't even recognize. I don't even acknowledge all of the good that God has poured into your life. Consider it. Consider where God has blessed us beyond measure, where you really can't calculate how far out that is, or you can't extrapolate it that far. There are some here, and they're here basically every Sunday, and there's some that are going to watch on the internet who's going to say that they're not a Christian. They've just, they've just not trusted in Christ. They're not a believer. They're not born again. They're not saved. They can say that this morning, but they cannot say that they haven't experienced the goodness of God. They cannot say that. They can't say that they haven't experienced the abundance of God. How do we qualify that? Because they're still alive. They're still breathing God's air. He, he, he spared your life countless times over and over again he's delivered you here this morning to be here to hear this message or to be hearing it over the the internet you get the opportunity to experience his goodness as you hear all about his saving grace the goodness of god and the provision of god and to acknowledge he is good and he is perfect in all of his ways but it is tragic how some, hearing me now, knowing the truth of Scripture, reading and repeating these verses together with us, will never experience God's blessing through salvation. If you're here this morning and are listening online and you've never been saved, God wants none to perish this morning. He wants none to, he wants all to come to repentance and eternal life. 
So in just this, in, in these closing moments, take inventory of your life. Both the saved and the lost this morning. Take inventory of your life. Where have we failed to recognize God's goodness? And taking it for granted or even taking it as a work of our own righteousness. Maybe this morning we need to confess our sin. Sin where we've, where we've just assumed things from God and about God. And some of this truth about God's goodness and His perfections has convicted us that we have to cry out and we say, God, forgive us for being so casual about your goodness and your greatness. And it keeps it from running over to other people in our lives. That we would trust the, God's Word and receive His salvation and forgiveness. We've been reminded this morning that God never changes and He cannot change. But we can change. We can change radically and we can change and, and we can be changed eternally in an instant. I remember when I was lost. I remember when I was lost and I thought I was saved. And God in His great grace showed me that and then I know when I was delivered by God knowing it was Him and Him alone and nothing in me. I remember that. The goodness of God to show me that. The patience of God to show me that. To eternally and radically change my life. And He did so by His grace and by His word of truth, by faith. So see, this morning we can all sit here and we can all take inventory and recognize and make a list of where we've encountered God's goodness. And we can examine our lives and we can confess our sins. But the glory is this, those who are dead in Christ this morning, those who under the condemnation of God because you've not cried out to Him and you trusted something other than His shed blood on the cross to forgive you and to redeem you in His resurrection power, you can even see, receive this word of truth this morning salvation and forgiveness and he will show us he will show you how to live your life as he would live your life if he were if he were you let's close in prayer Father, those may be some of the most casual words that we utter as your children. Oh, God's good. We wouldn't want to call you anything else. God's good. God, we've, we've seen this morning more concisely, more accurately what that means. And so we would ask, we would ask individually, we would ask corporately that you would forgive us for the casual manner and the cavalier manner that we've lived out underneath your glorious grace and goodness, your sovereign grace. It's not about wasting, it's just not acknowledging it. And so, Lord, we thank you for this, these strong truths of Scripture that we've seen this morning. And we pray that we wouldn't just ponder those things in our heart, but we would act upon that. And that we would obey your Holy Spirit as you would lead us this morning to not just consider the message, but to act on it. For those who are not saved that are here or even watching on the internet, oh God, this morning, would, would this, you have, you have chosen them. May, may they respond to that this morning. And may they, be, may they come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. And Lord, for those things in our own personal lives that are hindering us from being a living testimony, an example, a beacon of your light and goodness, I pray that you would show that to us this morning as well. So as we sing, O oh God, receive our worship. As we confess, O oh God, forgive our sins. That we would faithfully respond to your truth, truth and spirit this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
stand with us as we sing. Captain. 
When I first became a believer, when I was 24, it was probably a few months later, I sat down with my parents and, and I just apologized to them. And what I said to them is, all the things that you had purchased for me and all the love that you had ever shown me, and whether it be electricity or food or whatever they had given me, I'd spent my whole life using it to fuel my own lusts and to destroy myself and to do the things that I knew would break their hearts. And that flowed out of the understanding of how we treat the graces of God. My friends and I, we were born tall and strong and healthy and intelligent, and we used those things to do all the things that God hated because we're like our father Adam and our mother Eve, and we distrust his character, and we believe that what he forbids is the thing that's truly to be enjoyed when he has offered Christ all along and all things given to us, whether it be our intellect or our beauty, our ability to reason, whatever it is, is so that we can enjoy and know him more fully. And so I had rejected the greater gift for the lesser thing. And that brings us to Titus 3, 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now he prefaces that. He says that in verse 2, or verse 3, for we ourselves were once foolish disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And it's only when we look to the goodness and the loving kindness of God expressed in Jesus Christ that we can be free from such things. And what we'll find is not that God has been cutting us off from what is good, but what is good has been waiting for us all along. So let's take a moment and pray together. Father God, thank you for not giving us what we deserve. Lord, we are all cosmic rebels. Lord, we have all threw away your hand of love and mercy and grace and rejected it for that which would destroy us. And Lord, in your character, out of the goodness of who you are and out of your mercy and grace, you have pursued us. You came from heaven to seek us. And you took on human flesh and lived the life that we have failed to live. And you died the death that we deserve to die. And you've given us eyes to see and ears to hear and minds to understand the glories and the riches of Christ, which we will not unpack in a thousand years or a thousand times a thousand years. Lord, when we see him in heaven, we will take all the crowns that we have earned in this life, Lord, all of the talents and all the great things and all the kings and everything that man has ever accomplished. We will throw these at his feet because we will see in him one far more worthy of all these temporal things that just melt away and are like so much mist and vapor. Lord God, we are nothing in relation to Christ, and you have made him our king and our savior. You have adopted us into his family and made him our brother. Lord, we swim in an ocean of your grace and love and mercy day after day. Let us not distrust your character, but let us rest in it and find in Christ the full expression of every good thing, that when we see his cross, that we might know that we are loved and valued despite our sin, and in him that we might find the answer to all the deepest needs of our hearts. And we ask it in Christ's name for our good, and that you might be glorified. And amen.